It's a stunning landscape of verdant forest, sheer mountains and meandering streams. Aside to Fukushima, few outsiders get to experience. And after the nuclear fallout drifted and settled here, few would now want to. Today, I have come back to check whether the much publicised decontamination of this poisoned landscape has reached into Fukushima's remote mountains. Well, we're a few kilometres into the no-go zone here near the village of Namiya. And the higher you climb up into the mountains, the higher the reading on the Geiger counter. So it would suggest that uh, a lot of radiation is still in the mountains in areas that are very, very difficult to clean up. Nestled in the valleys or hidden away in the mountains are hundreds of hamlets like this. Irradiated, abandoned and now overgrown. It's doubtful anyone will return because there's been no attempt at decontamination here. It's like a science fiction movie in which everyone has simply vanished. But the man I am on my way to visit doesn't fear the fallout. Having refused to leave his Fukushima farm just a few kilometres from the melted reactors, Nato Matsumura is often described as the most contaminated person in Japan. <laughs> Helping Nato Matsumura combat the loneliness is his collection of stray animals. Today, like every day, he's back inside the nuclear no-go zone in the village of Tomioka to feed some abandoned cattle that can never be sold or leave the zone. Tomioka is where Nato Matsumura was born. The empty streets, the abandoned shops, the train station to nowhere, none of it bothers him. Neither does the fact that nature is slowly reclaiming what people have left behind. It's spring. So Matsumura takes me to a nearby village, once renowned for its natural beauty. This is the village of Yonomori inside the nuclear no-go zone, and this is its famous Sakuradori, Cherry Blossom Street. These blooms have come out five times since the Fukushima nuclear disaster and it's been five years since anyone sat here to eat, drink, celebrate the annual cherry blossoms. <laughs> While we marvel at the blossoms, the loudspeakers in this empty village crackle into life with a daily announcement from the Safety Affairs Office. In 30 minutes, the no-go zone will close Please leave the area immediately, it says. But not even these abundant, beautiful blooms can distract from the truth of this contaminated landscape. All over the polluted zone, thousands of workers are busy scraping up the topsoil into large black bags and only from the air can you appreciate the sheer scale of this operation. So far, more than 10 million of these bags have been filled. They're then stacked at thousands of separate locations across the contamination zone. 
Despite the efforts so far, more than 1,100 square kilometres of Fukushima's forests, mountains and villages remain uninhabitable. Dozens of communities still haven't been touched. More than 160,000 people were forced to evacuate during and after the Fukushima nuclear meltdowns. Now, five years on, 100,000 still have not returned. Some remain trapped in tiny temporary apartments, while others say they'll never return to these contaminated communities. Most of those forced to flee the radiation will forever remain nuclear refugees, according to the man who was Prime Minister during the disaster, Nato Khan. But a few have come back. It was nearly five years before Azuma and Yumiko Hashimoto were allowed to return to their decontaminated home in Naraha town. Mrs Hashimoto's family has lived in this house for eight generations. But that looks like where the line will end because her daughter is refusing to return with her one-year-old son. In fact, Naraha is now a village without children because no one with a family wants to come back. The silence is particularly haunting for Azuma Hashimoto because for years he was in charge of disaster prevention at both of Fukushima's nuclear plants. Foreign correspondent has been invited by the plant operator TEPCO to spend a day touring the sprawling facility and to meet the man in charge of decontaminating and decommissioning the Fukushima plant, Naohiro Masada. Has anything like this ever been attempted before? The former Prime Minister, now a fierce opponent of nuclear power, disagrees. For the initial part of our tour of the nuclear plant, we are kitted out in light protection gear. And our first stop is a reminder of the colossal task facing TEPCO. So this is the tank area. So here we've got over a thousand tanks on this site. TEPCO is removing about 62 nuclear substances from the water. The only one they can't remove is tritium, but so far they're taking at least 62 elements out. But still, there's about a thousand tanks on site that they've got to deal with. Tritium goes directly into the soft tissues and organs of the human body, potentially increasing the risk of cancer. The site has nearly reached its capacity, with more than half a million tonnes of contaminated water much of it pumped in to keep the melted reactor fuel from heating up again. Tritium is 
But on top of that, every day, 150 tonnes of groundwater flows into the plant. And some believe this poses the biggest threat of all. What concerns me is the volume of water um, that exists at the site. This water contamination problem is not under control and it's not really controllable. There really isn't any way to stop it. Particle physicist Gregory Yotsko was the chairman of the United States Atomic Watchdog when Fukushima melted down. He was getting real-time information as the disaster unfolded. He warns that the task of keeping three melted reactors stable and then cleaning them up will take decades. It's a very, very difficult situation. There is no simple solution. There is no silver bullet that is going to put a stop to everything and, and, and make this just go away overnight. But there is one problem TEPCO can make go away, and that's getting rid of the millions of disposable protection suits and hazard masks used by the workers on site. And to do that, the company has built an incinerator several storeys high to begin burning the backlog, enough to fill 28 Olympic swimming pools. OK, well, the heat here is really intense, as you'd imagine, because this is the incinerator, the furnace, where they're burning all this irradiated protective gear. Now, every day, 6,500 workers are on this site, and sometimes they have multiple changes of clothing, so there's a lot of gear to burn, because a lot of it is unsafe, it's irradiated. Those 6,500 workers have come from all over Japan. Their radiation exposure is closely monitored. But last year, the allowable level was more than doubled. The country's nuclear watchdog says the step had to be taken to allow workers to stay on site longer in a bid to keep the crisis at Fukushima containable. We've spent several hours around the plant already, but we're going closer to the reactor buildings now, which means we've got to put on more heavy-duty protective gear. We're all set to go. For this part of our tour, we are accompanied by five minders because we are heading to the buildings housing the melted reactors and there are restrictions. TEPCO is worried about possible nuclear terrorism and won't allow us to film certain security sites. Reactor one, reactor two, reactor three with all the rubble over there. So be very careful. The radiation spikes the closer we go to the reactors, where deep inside lies the melted nuclear fuel and TEPCO's greatest challenge, according to the man with possibly the toughest job in Japan, decommissioning chief Naohiro Masada. I'm just metres away from the main reactor buildings here at the Fukushima nuclear plant, behind me reactor 3. Now we saw what happened there, there was a hydrogen explosion right after the nuclear fuel melted. Next to it, reactor 2. It's still a problem today. There was no hydrogen explosion, but what happened inside there, no one really knows because the radiation is so high. No one to this day has been able to get inside. And there is reactor one, and it could present particular problems for TEPCO because that is where probably the worst meltdown occurred. They don't know where the nuclear fuel is, and it could take TEPCO several years to even work that out. For the first time, foreign correspondent can reveal just how vast the amount of melted nuclear fuel is, the three molten blobs that lie somewhere deep within each of these buildings. え、
Exposure. Very high exposure. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's creeping up the closer we get to the, the building, yeah. the reactor building. We can't stay here. Okay. And the most daunting task, one the nuclear industry has never faced, is getting the melted fuel out. TEPCO admits the technology it needs hasn't been invented yet. And they've sent in some robots. All the robots have been disabled because of the high radiation fields. It may be possible that we were never able to remove the fuel. You may just wind up having to leave it there and somehow entomb it as it is. I mean, that's certainly a possibility. There's no playbook. They're making this up as they go along, and um, that's, in a lot of ways, the best they can do. Back on the bus, we head closer to the base of the reactor buildings. We hop off at reactor four and start to move down the line. So 157, 55. Immediately, the radiation level begins to rise. What's happening? Yeah, high. High, high, high. OK, so we're just between reactor four and reactor three, but the radiation level has gone up to, an, to, to a point where our TEPCO guides are not comfortable going any further. So we'll head back. After a day inside the nuclear plant, it is time to strip off our gear and submit to routine testing. It's a process the workers here go through every day, and it's a reminder of the decades-long task ahead of TEPCO. あの、この方々に一緒にこう見てもらって仕事のやり方をチェックしてもらったり、今一緒にこう判断をしてもらったりしてますし、音源時点で政府があの東電にまあいわばこう支援で出しとるお金が6兆円です。しかし、それだけでは
At this shrine, he adds the latest finds, including Yuna's kindergarten top. Deep down, he knows his youngest daughter will never be found. この Norio Kimura's community inside the fallout zone will never be rebuilt. In fact, it's destined to be the site of a dump for contaminated waste and soil. But further north, outside the zone, there's hope. I've returned to Rikazen Takada, which was wiped out by a 13 metre high tsunami. I arrived here in 2011, right after the waves, to be greeted by scenes of devastation and death. No survivors are being pulled out of here, just hundreds and hundreds of bodies. Five years on, I'm back in this exact same spot. And in the end, one in every 10 of Rikazen Takata's residents would die in the tsunami. The debris is all gone now, replaced by five million cubic tonnes of earth, scraped off a nearby mountain and put in the city centre. That's in the hope that this community can be raised by up to 13 metres to protect itself from future tsunamis. Rikazen Takada is a fishing town and Yoshiharu Yoshida is one of its shrewdest sea dogs. And when the earth shuddered five years ago, the fisherman was one of those who jumped on their boats and headed straight out into the Pacific, riding over the tsunami as it rolled towards the coast. As well as the earthworks to raise the town, authorities are building towering seawalls, some more than five storeys high. They're part of a 400 kilometre chain of gigantic tsunami defences being built along the coast of northeast Japan. But fisherman Yoshiharu Yoshida scoffs at the idea that concrete walls can repel the raw power of a tsunami. While some communities outside the zone rebuild, others in the contaminated areas continue to crumble and wither. Few spots symbolise both the natural and nuclear disasters of 2011 better than the Ukedo Primary School. Here, the tsunami smashed through the bottom floor, while the top floor remained untouched except by the radioactive fallout from the nuclear plant just a few kilometres away. The 80 children of this school survived the waves, but they've never been back. Some former supporters of atomic energy now believe the risks are just too great, including those who had to deal directly with the fallout at the time. 
まず原発は、えー、他のエネルギーに比べて危険性が高いつまり従来は本来コストに、えー、として考えるべき事故の時の費用とかあるいはその使用済み燃料つまりは核廃棄物の処理の費用とかそういうものをコストにカウントしないことによって安い安いと言っていたんですが。You were the Prime Minister of Japan at the time. How close did this country come to all-out disaster? 非常に近いところまで行きました。これらの実機の原発すべてがあのメルトダウンに陥った時には、まあ日本の半分ぐらいあるいは日本全部がですね壊滅するそういう危険がありました。ある意味ではそのギリギリの瀬戸際までこの事故はあの瀬戸際まで来た事故でした。You have to now accept that at all nuclear power plants and wherever they are in the world that there's a chance you can have this kind of a very catastrophic accident and you can release a significant amount of radiation and have a you know a decade long cleanup effort on your hands and and that that's the reality of nuclear power. My journey ends on a beach I first visited after the disasters. Then I went in with police in radiation protection gear to search this area for bodies left behind by the tsunami. The beach is empty now, silent except for the waves. But just down the shore, hidden behind this outcrop, is the Fukushima nuclear plant. Its stacks visible in the distance. The waves that crashed over this coast five years ago caused the costliest natural disaster in human history. But the nuclear drama continues to play out inside this secluded facility, and will do for decades to come.